Welcome to the Murfreesboro City Council. Uh, it's October 12th, 2017. Uh, Vice Mayor Madeline Scales Harris has our prayer and our pledge. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Tonight, my spirit is leading me to do something that we haven't done before, but I'm not getting permission. I'm just being obedient to the spirit. I would like for everyone to just join hands, just the person next to you. Those of you that are at home, um, if you will mute your devices as we go to the Lord in prayer, as we just concentrate solely on his word, Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight as humble as we know how. We come to you thanking you for the little things that we look at, little things that we take for granted every day, such as our food, shelter, clothing, our families, Lord. We come to you humble because we're not worthy, Lord, because it's nothing but your grace that we are here tonight. Lord, you're awesome. You're awesome and you're God, you're God all by yourself. Please forgive us of our many sins. Lord, you have blessed us to live in a vibrant city that's peaceful, productive, and full of love. But Lord, our nation, our nation is in a mess. And you are, Lord, you are showing us signs of your presence and of your coming, such as the fires, the uh, floods, the storms. But yet, Lord, we are we're just not paying attention. We ask you to forgive us for this. And Lord, we're getting ready to have people who don't think, look, act, or worship like we do to come into our vibrant city. Lord, please forgive them in the pardon of their sins. And Lord, I ask that you embark in our spirits that we don't uh, look at this as a threat but allow us to see this as your way of allowing we, your children, to come together in peace and in love and to uplift your name, Lord, as we come together. And Lord, we ask a special uh, prayer on our clergy, Lord, that you will allow them to preach your word and lift you up and bring our community together in love and peace. We pray for the homeless, the veterans, the children, and Lord, we just pray for love and peace. And Lord, we ask a special prayer for the ones that will be protecting us through these rough days, Lord. Give them special protection, not only physically, but spiritual protection. And Lord, as we get ready to handle the business of this city, we ask that you move among us and bring us in harmony as we make decisions that will be best for all of our citizens. Lord, this is my prayer that I ask in your darling son's name. Amen. 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 I have a quick uh, statement I, I, I want to read. Um, you know, after we've pledged allegiance to our to our country and and said the prayer, um, I feel like I need to make a public statement uh, on behalf of the city council, uh, confronting, uh, talking about a, a serious matter confronting our community. As Mayor Murphy spread on behalf of the city council, we want to condemn in no uncertain terms the ideology of white nationalists and white supremacists who are planning to bring their ideas to Murfreesboro. As mayor of the fastest growing city in the state of Tennessee and one of the fastest growing in the nation and home to the largest undergraduate university in, in the state of Tennessee, we are proud of the community we are building and the diversity of our residents who live here. We stand and work together every day to represent all the residents in this community. We stand together to make sure every person in this city has an equal opportunity to the things that Murfreesboro has to offer. 
We realize that there is much discussion about the potential rally in our city, and I want you to know this. The city of Murfreesboro and this council are committed to both protecting the constitutional rights we have taken an oath to uphold and to the peace and to the public safety of our city. Be assured we will take every step necessary to protect both. All right, we do have a proclamation that we need to give out tonight. Um, we've, we have a, a young lady who's been representing Murfreesboro and MTSU. So I wanna ask uh, Ms. Kristen Perry if you will come up. you want to uh, introduce yes sure I'd love to um, yep my mom and dad Lewis and Betsy Perry are sitting right there and my friend Colin and then we have uh, Susan Baker and Patty Drury is somewhere they're my directors for Miss MTSU so they actually surprised me with this tonight I had no idea what we were doing here <laughs> <laughs> well councilman Lance is gonna want to wear the crown here in a little bit is that <laughs> Tell everybody, man. All right. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I saw Patsy um, today at, uh, at Susan, I'm sorry, at uh, Northfield today. So I got to speak to a group of, of fifth graders, which is a, a lot of fun. They were studying uh, Murfreesboro had been hit by a natural disaster, and they were figuring out how to rebuild Murfreesboro. So it was, it was, it was a cool thing. All right, so we have a proclamation. It says, whereas Kristen Perry claimed the crown of 2017 Miss MTSU pageant, a lifelong resident of Murfreesboro and graduate of Middle Tennessee Christian School, and whereas Kristen is an organizational communications major and member of Alpha Delta, Alpha Delta Pi, she uses her title and to help others in charitable events and civic group meetings serving as MC or speaker. And whereas she had made numerous community school appearances promoting reading, music, art, and preventing substance abuse, Kristen is passionate about helping child the Children's Miracle Network hospitals. She has a heart for community and does a commendable job at be being a community servant. Now, therefore, I, Shane McFarland, Mayor of the City of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, on behalf of the entire City Council, do pro proclaim October 12, 2017 as a day to recognize Kristen Perry and encourage all citizens to join in this worthy recognition. I also want to recognize, I know we have a lot of people who are in the audience, but uh, especially we have uh, Leadership Rutherford who is, who is here. So if you're with Leadership Rutherford, will you stand up? All right. The secret that they have not told y'all, if y'all try to leave early, uh, we will chastise you as you're walking out the door. So, just kidding. All right, we have the consent agenda. You have several items on the cons consent agenda before you. No question, I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion to second, Ms. Ms. Tucker, if you'll call the roll. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. We have the meeting, uh, the minutes of the September 28, 2017 uh, regular meeting, but in that we also have uh, a change that we need to make on Mr. Scott Usselton's term for the Pension Commission. It will be expiring 6-1-2020 instead of 2019. So moved. Second. Can I get that as amended, please? As amended. As amended. All right. Ms. Tucker, if you call the roll. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. We'll move into second readings. We have a letter from the Assistant Planning Di Director regarding Ordinance 17 OZ 33. Mr. Blomley. Thank you, Mayor McFarland, and uh, good evening, Mayor McFarland and members of council. I uh, don't have much to say on this one other than the fact that, uh, as promised, the uh, applicants for this rezoning request on, uh, on Veterans Parkway, the Horde and McCullough families, have recorded the restrictive covenants that were before you at last week's meeting or the, or the meeting two weeks ago when you approved it on first reading. So 
as promised, they've moved forward and recorded those restrictive covenants. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions here on second reading. I'll move for approval. Second. Motion second. Ms. Tucker, if you'll call the roll. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. We have a letter from the Assistant Planning Director, Director regarding Ordinance 17 OZ40. I'm back. Um, I'm pitch hitting for Mr. Anthony on this one. Uh, uh, you'll recall that at last week's meeting, or two weeks ago, at your meeting when you uh, voted to approve on first reading the Joe B. Jackson Parkway PRD, there were several changes that Mr. Mulchan with SEC uh, made um, verbally, some commitments that he made verbally. The applicants have, uh, have incorporated those changes into a revised pattern book, and it's in the agenda package before you, um, as promised. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Second. Motion is second. Ms. R Ms. Tucker. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Ms. Perry, I don't mean to stop the meeting, but you do not have to sit through all this if you want to. Y'all, you and your family are free to go if y'all don't, <laughs> don't want to. What's that? Yeah, absolutely. So. I'll make it in the form of a suggestion, even. Yeah. <laughs> It's just leadership Rutherford that we will we will get if they try to leave. So thank you guys again. Item five A letter from the principal planner regarding ordinance seventeen OZ forty one. On this one I'm pinch hitting for Mr. Anthony and, and Ms. Green. Um, the uh, letter before you addresses the concerns that uh, that a resident brought up for the marketplace at Savannah Ridge rezoning with regards to the uh, to a possible traffic signal at Highfield Drive. The letter contains Mr. Balachandra's um, response to that. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And Mr. Balachandra is here if you have any questions for him from the city, city's transportation department. Any questions? I guess the only comment I would make is that as this De development proceeds, we might get a little clearer picture of the impact and the concerns of the neighborhood. I mean, just continue to monitor this. I know this is a state road, and but but uh, it may need to be addressed as the development proceeds. And I'd, I'd encourage us to keep an eye on how this, uh, even though we're constrained to some degree by what we can, how we can address the problem at the present time. There may be other avenues that we can address some of the congestion because of the that was presented by the neighbors. Yes, sir. Councilman Chocolate, I think that, um, and one thing that Mr. Balatrandra indicated in his, in his response is that depending on how things build out, uh, I think this is going to be a multi-phase project. Um, uh, I think traffic conditions will have to be evaluated as the development occurs. And uh, so I think uh, Mr. Balatrandra understands the, the concerns and will be monitoring that. Good point, Mr. Shacklett. If there's no more questions, I'll move for approval. Second. Ms. Tucker, if you'll call the roll. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Consider for passage on second and final reading ordinance 17 OZ 42 to zone an area along Osborne Lane to single family residential 10 RS 10 district and plan a residential development PRD district simultaneous with annexation and rezone an area along Osborne Lane to single family residential 10 RS 10 district. For approval. Second. Motion is second. Ms. Tucker. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Consider for passage on second and final reading ordinance 17 OZ 43 to rezone an area along Manson Pike to Commercial Fringe CF District. So second. Motion is second. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. <coughs> Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Consider for passage on second and final reading ordinance 17 OZ 44 to amend Kimbro Woods PRD and to rezone an area along Veterans Parkway to plan residential development PRD district Kimbo Wo Kimbro Woods PRD. Move for approval. Second. Motion is second. 
Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. We have a letter from the City Recorder Finance Director, which is Ordinance 17052, amending the fiscal year 2018 budget. Ms. Tucker. Uh, yes, this amendment is mostly just housekeeping for items y'all have already approved this year. This will allow us to enter purchase orders and pay the invoices for those items. Um, if there's any questions about any of them, I'm glad to answer any questions. All right, we'll consider for passage on first reading ordinance 17052, amending the 1718 budget on First Amendment. So moved. Second. Motion is second, Ms. Tucker. <clears throat> Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. We'll move to new business and pursuant to resolution 17 R PH 46, adopted by the City Council on October. August 31st, 2017, will conduct a public hearing to consider an adoption of a plan of services for an annexation of approximately 107.6 acres and two zoning of approximately 107.6 acres along Yergin Road to plan residential development, PRD District, Magnolia Grove, PRD, which have been proposed to be annexed to the City of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Mary Lou Dotson and TVLP Management LLC applicants 2017-509 and 2017-419. Notice of the said public hearing was published in the September 25th, 2017 issue of a local newspaper. Mr. Blomley. Thank you, Mayor McFarland. <coughs> excuse me. This is the, <coughs> excuse me. This is the first of two parts. We have the annexation and the zoning. The first public hearing that we're going to have is going to be strictly for the annexation. And as you know, the annexation will be broken into two parts, one the an actual annexation itself and then the plan of services. Um, the subject property is the area colored in blue on the map before you, uh, property along the north side of, Os or of uh, Jurgen Road, and it is directly to the south of the West Wind subdivision and Veterans Parkway. Property was requested for annexation and we conducted a, uh, a plan of services. The plan of services has been included in the materials before you. It shows that we can uh, provide services to the subject property upon annexation. Uh, there's one little hiccup there. There's an existing house on the north side of Jurgen Road. Right now, Jurgen Road doesn't have a, a large enough water line that we can provide fire protection to the existing house. So um, you'll notice in the plan of services, it states that that existing house will need to be demolished before we can effect the annexation because we cannot provide uh, fire protection or uh, at least the ISO class two fire protection that we're accustomed to seeing in the city um, to the existing house. Uh, it's my understanding uh, today from the applicant that the property, that the house is now vacant and um, that it will be demolished before second reading of the zoning. If the zoning passes, then they will demolish it before the zoning passes first reading and the house will be demolished before second reading. But uh, the, uh, the property itself will be able to be served kind of as, as the city grows in, or as, the, um, as development grows into it. Development will actually be coming from the north, from the West Wind subdivision. Utilities will be extended um, from West Wind into this property. So with that being said, I'll be happy to answer any questions with regard to the annexation. Planning Commission did conduct a public hearing on the annexation on July the 12th and voted unanimously with one abstention to recommend the approval of the annexation. Uh, we'll conduct the public hearing on the annexation and then have separate resolutions with regards to the annexation and the plan of services. Um, <coughs> as I mentioned, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Okay, we're going to conduct a public hearing on the plan of services and the. One question, Mr. Mayor. We will open the public hearing and then any questions you have. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, we, we won't leave you out, I promise. Um, we're going to conduct a public hearing on the plan of services and the annexation for approximately 107.6 acres located along Jurgen Road. Um, before we do that, uh, during a public hearing, if you're wishing to speak for or against uh, the, the proposal, if you're representing an individual, you'll have three minutes. If you're representing uh, a community or a neighborhood, you'll have five minutes. If you'll ask all questions to the city council, uh, we will get those answered at the end of the public hearing. Um, so this is on the annexation and the plan of services. Anyone wishing to speak for or against, please come to the, to the podium.
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. My name is Mark Bradley. I live on Jurgen Road. I'd like to take this opportunity to address the negative traffic impacts that will be created by, by building this proposed 300 home development. It should be noticed that the issues were, uh, that the, uh, issues were brought up during the Planning Commission meetings as well as single meeting between current residents and the developer. And to date, there have been no revisions made to the proposal that address the looming significant traffic increases on Jurgen Road and surrounding thoroughfares. The traffic impact study reveals that there will be an additional 2,855 trips per day from the proposed development. While the study underscored significant delays and assessed the need for traffic signals, et cetera, it does not address the physical impact to the roads. A 1,000 percent increase in traffic volume will, without a doubt, wear and tear a road that was not designed for urban density traffic. It's a rural, narrow, winding, 1.7-mile stretch of country road. The study did not account for traffic from existing neighborhoods, such as West Wind, that will be able to access Jurgen Road when Pitcher's Lane, one of the roads in the development, is connected through. The study does not include all the ongoing developments in the area that simply were not there when this was proposed. There are many developments on Armstrong Valley Road that are being built right now, which will simply add to the traffic congestion there. We don't even know how many more trips per day that would add to the 2,855. Relative to the intersection of Jurgen and Thompson Road and Armstrong Valley, the traffic impact study summarizes, and I quote, the lane widths, cross sections, and alignments at this intersection do not meet current standards established by the city of Murfreesboro. As additional development occurs in the vicinity of this intersection, increasing traffic volumes will decrease the levels of service for the left turns from the main street and all of the turning movements from the side streets. Therefore, it would be appropriate for the city of Murfreesboro to establish a long-term improvement plan for the intersection of Armstrong Valley Road and thompson Jurgen Road. This must be addressed before we keep developing in this area. We need to do the infrastructure before we build more. It's apparent through observation that the potential for more homes adjacent to the subject property will eventually be in line for development. That's the reality in Murfreesboro. We're growing fast. Will the traffic then increase by another 2,800 trips, 5,000 trips on Jurgen Road? We need to know. This is the essence of what proper planning is all about. This proposal results in the shared responsibility between Rutherford County and the city to maintain Jurgen Road. I was personally disheartened to hear that when a local news reporter called the city to ask about this proposal, the reporter was directed to the county. When the, uh, the reporter called the county, the reporter was directed back to the city. This does not bode well for the assumption that our two local governments will be in harmony when the inevitable deterioration of Jurgen Road occurs. By then, the developer will be long gone, off to another project, leaving this community of Tennessee citizens, many born and raised in Murfreesboro, to fend for themselves. Uh, also, Council, I've, I've handed out a, a general um, handout for you that addresses m a multitude of issues that other community members would like to speak so that we're not repetitive. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. waiting for some eye contact. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Pat Sanders. I'm having a hard time hearing the mayor, and I don't know why, but I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Pat Sanders. I have lived on Armstrong Valley Road 54 years this month, and I have witnessed this area um, that we're talking about for Magnolia Grove and how the water is always there. Uh, it's like it should be called um, Kimbro Lake or Jurgen Lake. It's, it's a very wet area, and I have just recently learned there's a, a sinkhole there. Last time I came here and talked to you all was about Bill Hunter's project with those three-story apartment houses, and they've sure enough been built at Springfield, you know, out there on the Manson Pike. I think they're being built or have been built. And there's a spring, and we had a discussion about the environmental impact there. That's the last time I've talked to you all. But I am concerned about this area for Magnolia Grove. 
I've also read a lot of, um, and I've seen the, the three detention ponds. I've seen your map. Um, three detention ponds, I don't see how it's going to take care of all that water that I've been witnessing for 54 years. I wanted to bring Connie Jurgen McGee here with me tonight. She's 90. Uh, she's 94, and she wanted to come, and she did go to the hearing in July for the Planning Commission. She's right impacted, and she's worried. And, of course, she went to this nice Mr. Lewis, Bob Lewis, I don't know if he's here, with the city, and he said, oh, don't worry about it. It's going to be 15 years. You don't need to worry about it. Well, she still hasn't been set at ease about it. Um, and her concerns are the traffic and the drainage. Um, those are the things, and that road is a dinky little road. I think Councilman Shacklett was going to drive on it. Have any of you el others driven on Jurgen Road and seen it? I, I, I hate to bring this up, but Rucker, Rucker Lane was annexed, and you all were going to do something about that road. And it's a sharp drop off on each side, and it has not been widened. So. Anyway, I think some things need to be looked into before you vote, if there can be some delay, and look at the hydrology, especially. That's it. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Kim Bradley and I live on Yergin Road. My remarks are going to be focused on the housing density and aesthetics. And I should point out that most of those will inform a lot of the issues and concerns that others will be bringing to your attention tonight, such as traffic congestion, surface runoff, road wear and tear, and the aesthetics of the community. The current plan proposes 300 homes on 105 acres with a misleading density of 2.86 houses per acre. When you remove the 30 acres of common area dedicated to streets, clubhouse, trails, etc., with no homes, the actual housing density is four houses per acre. This high concentration of quarter acre lots is inconsistent with the existing large lots in the area. The average residential size of the lots on Jurgen Road and Ashley subdivision is 4.18 acres with a minimum lot size of one acre. Also in the current plan, there's not an acceptable transition between the proposed development and the existing single family homes across the street. A three foot high, foot, a three foot high landscape berm incorporated into a 10 foot wide type B buffer as a landscape transition is not adequate to provide a screen from the proposed development to the existing community. While the SEC proposal shows examples of plants that would be installed in that berm, there's no real example of what the effect is, but I know that three feet is roughly waist high and that's simply not enough. In addition, we oppose the many requests for setbacks, uh, regulation, regulatory setbacks. They serve a purpose and are established to preserve a certain aesthetic that is consistent with the city's challenge of balancing Murfreesboro's existing charm, ambiance, and community feel with anticipated and welcome growth. The setback reductions request in this proposal in some cases are as high as 60% less than is required by regulation. For example, some homes on the 51 feet lots will be 10 feet apart. To decrease the setback requirements allows a greater density of homes to be developed, but it does nothing for the existing community members and is a significant disadvantage. As a result of all of these issues, the community is worried about our property values when the primary reason for moving there anyway is the rural appeal. Following all of this, there was a public hearing that re resulted in a secondary meeting which led to a petition that I would like to present to you tonight. The issues that were uh, described are very succinct and there's only three main uh, requests within that peti petition and they should be acceptable by both parties. We did not go to the local Walmart or Publix and sit in the parking lot to get a bunch of signatures. We addressed community members only and we held an event in which they came out and they came out in large numbers. A rural commun community of four or five square miles, we have 287 petition signatures. 
And with that, I'd like to give the signature page and petition to you and the subsequent notes from my discussion to the entire group. And I would call your attention to the second and third pages on the handout, which show pictures of the neighborhood. Thank you very much, Ms. Bradley. We want, to we want to hear from everyone who has to speak, but I just want to make sure that as we're talking, that this is going to be, this public hearing is for the plan of services, which means that the city could provide services to the area, and then this is also for the annexation, not the zoning. So if the zoning does not, passed then the annexation and the plan of services would would not so i just want to make sure we're going to be talking about the zoning housing appearance appearance streets and those things at the next public hearing this one is just for plan of services and annexation you're still welcome to come i just want to make sure that if you're wanting to talk about the, the actual development that that will be the next public hearing which is right after this which is right after this so you're, you're still welcome to speak but Yes. That was the question. Okay, yeah, th this is for the plan of services and for the annexation. If the council passes the plan of services and the annexation, but the development does not pass on zoning, then the plan of services and the annexation are, are null and void. Correct, Mr. Tyndall? That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that clarification. No problem. I assume that the briefings we gave you just now can be rolled over to the... Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Yes. Okay. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's what the public hearings are for. Miss Sanders, can you hear me a little better now? Yes, yes, yes. All right. I'll do better speaking in the microphone. All right. Anyone else wishing to speak for the plan of services or the annexation, please come to the podium. Okay, seeing none, we'll consider adoption of resolution 17 r ps 46 to adopt a plan of services for approximately 107.6 acres along Jurgen road mary lou dotson applicant 2017-509 this is for the plan of services so moved second so uh, motion is second miss tucker vice mayor scales harris Aye. mr la lance mr shacklett mr smotherman Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Right, we'll now consider for adoption resolution 17RA46 to annex approximately 107.6 acres along Jurgen Road and then incorporate the same within the corporate boundaries of the city of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Tennessee Mary Lou Dotson, applicant 2017 509. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Vice Mayor Scales Harris? Aye. Mr. LaLance? Aye. Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. <coughs> Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll now consider or conduct a public hearing to consider zoning approximately 107.6 acres along Jurgen Road to plan residential development, PRD district, simultaneous with annexation, Magnolia Grove PRD, TVLP Management LLC, applicant 2017-419. Mr. Blomley? Thank you, Mayor McFarland, and I'll be brief because I know that uh, Mr. Taylor has a PowerPoint presentation in a moment, and I know there are a lot of folks that want to speak. Um, this is the companion zoning request. Um, they're requesting a rezoning to PRD, Planned Residential District, and I won't go into the specifics of the, uh, of the development because Mr. Taylor will do that in a moment. Uh, I will mention that the Planning Commission um, had a public hearing on this matter on July the 12th and deferred it at that meeting um, to hold a neighborhood meeting. Um, with the neighbors and there was a neighborhood meeting held at the church that's adjacent to the property shortly after the Planning Commission um, public hearing. Uh, the applicant went back and made some changes to the, uh, to the pattern book. I've outlined those changes in my letter. Uh, Mr. Taylor will go over those changes in more detail in just a moment. Um, but the item was brought back before the Planning Commission at its regular meeting on August the 16th and the Planning Commission voted to recommend approval of the PRD uh, at that meeting. There were uh, voted, it was a unanimous vote, but there were two abstentions at that vote. Um, real briefly, I wanted to point out the um, 
Murfreesboro 2035 comprehensive plan, future land use map. I have that map pulled up on the screen before you uh, with the um, location of the property noted on that plan. You'll notice that the northern area or the northern portion of the, uh, of the area is rec recommended to develop as auto urban residential, which is a density of three and a half to eight units per acre. And the southern half closer to Jurgen Road is recommended for suburban residential, which is a density uh, up to three and a half dwelling units per acre. The applicant's uh, proposed density is 2.86 dwelling units per acre, and that is taking into account the entire property, uh, open spaces, detention areas, uh, amenity centers, um, and then dividing it, uh, the total acreage by the, the number of units that's proposed, and you come out with 2.86 dwelling units per acre. So the, so the request density-wise is generally uh, consistent with the recommendation to the Murfreesboro 2035 Comprehensive Plan. Uh, it's actually, the density is actually a little bit lower than what is recommended by the Murfreesboro 2035 Plan uh, that was adopted by the Planning Commission in July of this year. Um, now I'd like to invite Mr. Taylor as he has a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions before or after the public hearing, and we have other members of staff that are available to answer questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Blomley. Um, I'm Matt Taylor of SCC, and I'm accompanied tonight by Mr. Daryl Hahn, the applicant on the project, Mr. Rob Mulchin, landscape architect in my office, as well as Mr. Roger Haley, um, a consultant on the project as well. I do have a brief presentation um, on the Magnolia Grove proposed PRD. We'll start by orienting you to the site. It is 105 acres, uh, mostly cornfield and woods. It's located to the north of Jurgen Road and to the south of Veterans Parkway. Um, surrounding developments, West Wind is directly to the north. Sheffield Park is to the northwest. There's an existing farm to the east of the property, uh, a church to the west, and then we're bounded directly on the south by Jurgen Road itself. Uses in the area are main, mainly single family detached, just like we're proposing. West Wind does have uh, some multifamily and some commercial fringe uh, land zoned. They are proposing townhomes and daycare on that portion of the property. This is looking um, from Ashley, which is on the south, looking north into the property. Uh, Mr. Blomley mentioned the existing house on the property. That is what you see on the right-hand side of this screen. This is looking from Jurgen into the property, so it'll be looking north. This is looking toward the uh, southwest corner of the property. That's one of the pockets of wetlands on the site. And then this is looking along Jurgen Road itself. Uh, the plan itself, we have requested a planned residential development, PRD. Uh, that would allow 300 lots on 105 acres. As Mr. Blomley said, that's 2.86 units to the acre, which is very comparable to the allowable density in RS-15, which is 2.9 units to the acre. Uh, in that plan, we have proposed three different lot sizes. The smallest of those would be a 51-foot wide lot. That would be a minimum of 6,000 square feet in size. We've proposed 116 of those. The next size up would be 65-foot wide for a minimum of 8,000 square foot lot size. We have 112 of those. And then the largest would be an 85 foot wide lot at a minimum of 10,000 square feet that has 72 lots at that size. We are preserving uh, several large pockets of wetlands that we have on site. One of those is to the north uh, in the central part of the community and the other is in the southwest corner of the property. We are enhancing those with the addition of walking trails around those to encourage people to get out and see these features and to enjoy those. Uh, at our connection to West Wind on the north side, and that's an extension of Pitcher's Lane that exists today, we are uh, introducing green space and entry monument signage as soon as we connect there to, to make a distinction between the two neighborhoods. We've also incorporated a roundabout in the central part of the neighborhood along pitchers uh, to discourage uh, speeders and straight cut through traffic. And then we've also planned for several connections to our neighbors through street stubs and two connections uh, for Jurgen. 
All of our streets here will be public streets as we're proposing all single family detached homes on individual lots of record. Uh, we feel like we've designed a very walkable community. We've got sidewalks on both sides of all of our streets. We've got walking trails in our open space. And uh, all this is within close proximity and good walking distance back to our main structured amenity in the heart of the neighborhood. Um, we are proposing to maintain about 28% open space that's spread across our structured amenity, uh, the wetlands, stormwater, and open areas. All of our utilities here will be underground. Uh, we are proposing to have decorative mailboxes and decorative lighting throughout to try to create that neighborhood cohesive feel. In addition, we have proposed a 50-foot wide landscape strip uh, with berm and buffer that's between the back of our lots and Jurgen Road. The homes themselves, uh, we'll start with the 51-foot wide lots. As I mentioned, there are 116 of these proposed. They are the lots that are colored on the screen here. These homes will start at 1,800 square feet in size. All of these will have two car garages, decorative garage doors, and we do anticipate most of these to be front entry. All the building materials within uh, Magnolia Grove will be consistent. The homes will be constructed of brick, stone, and cement board siding. The only vinyl will be in the trim and soffit areas. Here's a couple of examples of the type home we anticipate to be constructed on these lots. The 65 foot wide lots, we're proposing 112 of those. Uh, they will start at 2,100 square feet in size and again have two car garages, decorative doors, and the same quality building materials. And they are here shown in yellow on this master plan. Here's an example of what we anticipate on these lots. 85 foot wide lots shown in yellow on the map here. They will start at 2,400 square feet in size have two, uh, two car garages, decorative doors. We anticipate most of these to be side entry given the wider width. And again, the same quality building materials and an example of the top homes to be built here. The amenities, we tried to spread the amenities throughout the neighborhood. Uh, we've got open space to the north, to the south, and in the middle. These are the two pockets of wetlands that will be supplementing with walking trails. Our main structured amenity is at the heart of the community. We've got a pool planned, a playground, as well as some passive recreational area for people to throw a football, frisbee, have a picnic. And we've also got additional walking trails planned through uh, that passive recreational area as well. And we've got some additional open space to the north. And then on the south, we've got our landscape buffer along Jurgen Road. We'll also have entry monument signage at our connection to Jurgen as well as into West Wind itself. Access, we have, pl we have planned three uh, connections to existing streets. Two of those will be to Jurgen. One of those will be to Pitchers, which is where we'll start because that's where existing water and sewer are located. And then we'll work our ways toward Jurgen We've also planned for six stubs into neighboring properties that would be connected to and extended with future development. In addition, uh, our client has agreed to widen Jurgen Road along the uh, width of this property to three lanes. It's currently two lanes, so we'll be incorporating a center turn lane along the width of our property. And lastly, as Mr. Blomley said, we did have a neighborhood meeting uh, in July. Uh, we hosted that at uh, the church directly neighboring this property. It was very well attended. Uh, we made several revisions uh, coming out of that neighborhood meeting. First of those was what I just mentioned was we widened or would widen Jurgen Road to three lanes along the project's frontage. We shifted the roundabout an entire block at the neighbor's request to try to discourage, um, felt like that would be an a detractant for people to go south, help them to go north. 
We increased the landscape buffer along Jurgen Road from 20 feet to 50 feet. We also, uh, as a result of some of these changes, we revised our lot mix. We kept the same number at 300, but the 51 foot wides, we kept at 116. The 65 foot, we decreased by 23, went from 135 down to 112. And then the largest, we increased by 23. So we went from 49 lots up to 72 of those. And all these changes are reflected in your pattern book tonight. Uh, we also moved the large lots from internal to the development to be located on, along the southern boundary, um, directly adjacent to Jurgen, uh, adjoining that landscape buffer. And then we also made a second connection to Jurgen, uh, show that in our last phase of our development. Uh, we do have one, one connection to Jurgen in an earlier phase. Um, I believe that we would like to have that in our, at an earlier phase in discussions with staff, so it provides an outlet, another outlet. I'll be happy to answer any questions now or after the public hearing. Any questions for Mr. Taylor? Thank you, Mr. Taylor. I have a question. Oh, Ms. Kelsey Harris. You said that you conducted a um, meeting with the resident um, in July? Yes, ma'am, we did. Have you, did you address, were these items that are brought up tonight from the neighbors, were they addressed in the July? I'm not, I'm not sure what specifically was on the petition. What I heard uh, mentioned earlier was density. And I think as Mr. Blomley said, I think our density is relatively low. I think it falls within what the Murfreesboro's comprehensive plan um, calls for. Uh, aesthetics, uh, we have uh, from the beginning and continue to believe that we're putting a very quality home, uh, good aesthetics, good quality building materials in our proposal, so we've not made any revisions to that. Uh, as far as no transition, um, we typically see transition when we're talking about different uses, and we have a single family versus single family detached here, and um, we, we feel like it's very cohesive. Uh, we have made efforts, um, like I said, to increase the landscape strip along Jurgen. Um, we increased that 250% from what it originally was. And um, as far as setback variances, um, the five foot setbacks, those are commonplace. Um, I think almost every PRD that we have brought to you all over the past decade, decade and a half have the five foot sides. As a matter of fact, uh, we, this application was in process before the RS6 was passed, but I requested setbacks on the 51 and 65 foot wide lots are identical to what the setbacks are in the RS6 zoning. Uh, I believe the only other uh, setback uh, that was different for the 85s was that we requested a 20 or a 25 foot front setback on those when we had a side entry garage and that is, that's a purely a design element to get the homes closer to the street so it creates a better feel and um, more of a close-knit environment there. And then I heard property values. Uh, what we have seen traditionally is whenever you build single family versus single family, the new construction on a per square foot basis is higher than what the surrounding homes are and does not bring those down. Um, I did hear something about standing water. I wouldn't be surprised if there is some standing water out there today. Um, it's flat in spots, hence the wetlands, which we're preserving. Um, but we will manage our stormwater through our detention ponds. Uh, it will meet the city's stormwater regulations before it's discharged from the property, uh, just like every other subdivision we design. Um, during the planning commission, this is one thing I didn't mention. Uh, during the planning commission, uh, it was mentioned that along Ashley, they had some flooding on their side. Uh, in discussions with engineering since then, we think that there are probably some pipes underneath Jurgen that are inadequately sized, as we see a lot when we get out to the edges of the city. So we've agreed to upsize those pipes um, to let that water come on to us faster and at a better rate um, than it does right now. And so I, I think that we have been very responsive 
um, to those concerns. Um, if there's others that are listed on that petition, if you mention them to me, I'll try to address them best I can. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. All right, well, now we're going to uh, conduct a public hearing to consider zoning of approximately 107-point acres along Yergin Road to plan residential development, PRD district, simultaneous with annexation, TVLP Management LLC is the applicant. Anyone wishing to speak for or against, please come to the podium. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bay, we meet again. Uh, a couple things I want to address, obviously, not the previous comments notwithstanding. We'll carry those over to this because this is what it really applied to and apologize for that. A couple, couple items I do want to mention relative to widening the road along the length of the frontage of the proposed re, uh, development. It does nothing for traffic. It allows cars to turn more efficiently in and out of the neighborhood, but at some point you have county road bifurcated by city road. So there's going to be a bottleneck. As soon as the three lanes goes to two lanes, we're going to have traffic. So it's really doing nothing to improve the overall high-level traffic situation. I'd like to make a comment about the roundabout that's being proposed. The community did not uh, view that as an improvement. A roundabout, in our view, continues, it allows traffic to pro proceed smoothly. There's a roundabout in downtown Nashville that is the best thing they ever did because traffic keeps moving. So I, I would like to know from the developer at some point uh, how roundabouts uh, would incent people to go the other way. I think it would do exactly the opposite. A 50-foot long buffer is fine, but it needs to be higher, as was mentioned earlier. One of the uh, it, uh, items brought up was the phasing of the development. The original proposal had the phase of the builds to start far away from the existing residents. What in fact has happened is the opposite. The early phases of the development start right in front of our existing neighborhoods. So we view that as a negative impact that's been changed. Um, for property values, I would request from anybody who can show me in writing that trend that was stated uh, by the gentleman uh, preceding me. We'd like to see that uh, instead of hear about it. And last thing I'd like to know is relative to water, and I think some other folks are going to get more detailed. We'd like to see what, what's the plan for water. Can I see a hydrology report? Can our neighbors see a hydrology report? An official report that documents what water does. And I think someone will talk a little bit of that to more. So if you would please add those to my comments, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Hello again, too. Um, I, I just have a couple of comments based on what Mr. Taylor had said. Uh, we are familiar with the plan that he just reviewed for you. We've seen that plan. In fact, at the first meeting that we had after the public hearing, Planning Commission public hearing, they were directed to meet with us to hear from us our concerns. They came to that meeting with those changes. So they had already had in their mind what changes they were going to make without even listening to what the neighborhood had to say. What we said at that time was what's on that petition. We want less density. We want no entrances on Yergin, and we want no construction traffic. In addition to that, we had, I, have, I personally have made several requests for hydrology reports, and I've been given a one-page color map with arrows and depictions of water, wetland, little puddles or, or ponds. It's not, in my opinion, what should have been the basis for, for the plan going forward and, and why this should be okay in a very wet area. <clears throat> it seems to us that they really did not come planning to listen to what we had to say. They had in their mind already what they wanted to do and what would be the least amount of reduction in profit for them. And relative to the property values it may be true that when you put a single family re residential community next to a single family residential community that nothing changes or you may see an improvement and that would be the case if you're talking apples to apples i'd like you all to please turn to the second page of the pictures that i or the handout that i had uh, entitled density at the top those are what our neighborhood looks like that's the picture not the little pictures that were put up previously that showed a bunch of dried out cornfields. Our neighborhoods are beautiful, 
large multi-acre lots with grass, with ponds, with trees, beautifully landscaped. This is not farmhouse kind of living. This is a community with beautiful landscape and homes. And people moved there, and people will buy there for those reasons, not for a high congestion, high density community with a near zero lot line right across the street. Another thing that I think somebody else will uh, has more information about, but I'll go ahead and mention it here relative to the road. Your own report, or a report by Fishback Transportation, says there are, the standards are not met at that main intersection of Armstrong Valley and Yergin Road. It says that it's not prepared for what's going on there now. By adding 2,853 additional trips per day, I, I, I shudder to think of what it will be like. In addition, those roads are closed at least on an annual basis due to high water and flooding. And when that happens, there's no notice until you drive up to that intersection and you are forced to turn around and go back. That means all those beautiful houses on those pictures, all of our driveways and that narrow two-lane winding road are going to be used as a turnaround parking lot. And it's going to be dangerous and the safety's, safety is a big issue. And that's the end of my remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. talk about the hydrology report my name is Zach Brown and I would like us, to address Mr. concerns Brown, can regarding you tell, can you tell us where you live please oh 3934 Ashley Drive thank you sir are we good to go yes sir all right awesome I would like to address concerns regarding the watershed impact to our area yeah. our community is in a very wet area even the proposed property development has protected wetlands locations within its boundaries. During certain times of the year, many of our homesteads have standing, standing water for several months out of the year. Our concern is that a 300 home neighborhood will have a detrimental water impact on surrounding properties. Properties that we bought with no expectation of additional water and drainage issues. There are numerous neighbors that can give you details and personal experiences with flooding and high water. When we met with the Planning Commission in July, we provided a detailed document outlining our concerns. We asked for a comprehensive hydrology analysis, among other things, and, and have received nothing. The only information we have received is a one-page topographic picture and water flow arrows. We have no detailed analysis as to the design of the detention ponds or surface runoff and drainage impact. Before this matter is considered, we must be able to review these reports because of the proximity, direct proximity to existing Murfreesboro residents with the proper amount of time for us to consider these uh, new documents. If a proper hydrology report and watershed study has not been accomplished, the community requests this to be provided before you consider this proposal. From proposed neighborhood, this community must have a appropriate assurance that there is not gonna be a negative impact. I'd like to know what the plan is when road closures occur, when Armstrong Valley Road and the increased number of vehicles is trying to turn around the back or back up on a narrow road with no shoulders and what a emergency situation would look like. What plan has been created to address this? And I have a hydrology report for you guys to look at. I don't know how I do this. There we go. So I believe that's it. Thank you, Mr. Brown. You're welcome.
I got you busy tonight. Close. Okay. You need a cookie? Well, you're getting your exercise. Give me steps in. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I'm Mary Duvall. I live on Michelle. Um, if you come off of here and directly through their yard. Ms. Falk, if you wouldn't mind talking to them. You can, pull, you can pull that microphone down so you can. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much. Another reason we're opposed to building 300 homes with two entrances on Yergin Road is because flooding issues on Armstrong Valley, Yergin Thompson, have not been properly addressed. Once again, they were brought up in the meeting in July. We've not received response that assures existing residents that we will not be adversely impacted due to more high water and runoff and subsequent road closures. Also, the other end of Jurgen floods. It doesn't do it as often, but it does. Jurgen and Thompson feeds off of Armstrong, which is the most major north-south thoroughfare in the area. This road floods on a recurring basis each year. It happened most recently, I believe it was March 21st. One of the neighbors has video of it and photographs. When the water's high, the road is not passable. The traffic is shut down with zero notice until you drive up on it. With 2,800 additional daily trips, this will be an even worse nightmare for the citizens driving to and from work, school, and church. Emergency vehicles, mail, and other deliveries, in fact, will be dangerous and create safety issues as vehicles approach and must turn back. We cannot keep building homes in the area until this issue is resolved. The creek that runs along Armstrong Valley is inadequate to handle current water flow and drainage, let alone more runoff from proposed neighborhood. This community must have the appropriate assurances that there is not going to be a negative impact. I'd like to know what the plan is when road closures occur on Armstrong Valley and the increased number of vehicles is trying to turn around or back up on a narrow road with no shoulders. And what about if, an, if it's an emergency situation? What plan's been created to address this? Does anybody have one at all? No. Another thing I wanted to bring up, I like to get out and walk a lot. I have dogs, we get out, we roam around. The only thing I really worry about walking around out there is the animals. You bring all these people in, I mean, it's too many back there. The road, you kind of have to judge when you want to get out and walk on it now because it is such a small road. You bring all these other cars in here, there's a lot of people get out and run, they get out and walk their animals. You know, ride bikes, that's gonna shut us down. I mean, we're not gonna be able to get out and enjoy our scenery, enjoy what we moved there for, you know, if we wanted to live in the city, we would have stayed there. I mean, can we cut it down a little bit, just kind of compromise and take it from what it is to what you want it and leave something in the middle for the rest of us? I mean, it's, it's just too much. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Falk. Hi, my name is Linda White. I live on Jurgen Road. We've been living there for 14 years now. I grew up here in Murfreesboro, over there on Manson Pike, which is now what? Medical Center Parkway. Thank you. I saw a lot of changes all through the years. I saw my, my uh, dad and mom's uh, property being um, sold, bought out, so I've gone through a lot, gone through school all here. So this is my home. And I watched you salute the pledge. I would listen to that beautiful prayer. And that said one thing to me, freedom. We have freedom here. People, I want you to stop and think about a turtle. A turtle in a nice little pan with cool water sits there and go, this looks so good as if the gentleman was explaining to all of you. But he sits there and the sun gets hotter and hotter and he gets hotter but he can't get out. And then what happens? He dies. 
Are we going to let our city just keep on growing and be a Chicago? We had a friend to come and stay with us, and she didn't even know what a cow was or a goat. We love our neighborhood. We love our fields with the corn and um, the cotton. You can't even see a cotton field right now. Why are we allowing our beautiful Rutherford County being soaked up with houses all for the sake of a dollar? Please, people, think. Think hard before you allow this to happen. We have a beautiful little black church right across the street with a cemetery that only God knows how old some of those stones are. It's peaceful to come there and worship. But if you have 300 homes, there's no more peace anymore. There's no more animals running. There's no more deers going out, turkey. We are going to lose everything that we desire to see. So, City Council, it's on your hands what our future is going to hold. And please, in God's name, don't do it for the dollar bill. Thank you, Ms. White. Anyone else wishing to speak? Uh, I want to say. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Pat Campbell. I live on 3927 Yergin Road. Um, this is the only paper I have, and I think this was um, the, at the original proposal from SEC. And I think Mr. Bradley spoke of it earlier, like where they, you know, if they, they're doing this in phases, like one, two, three, four, five. And with each phase, they're starting on like, well, three, one is down here. But anyway, they're starting to the, what is that, south side toward um, Veterans Parkway, that side. Well, I can't show it. <laughs> but I don't have the updated one, so I don't know. But I, I, saw, I saw one, I think, at our meeting, and it was, they have now started over in front of where everyone lives, which, see, and really all we're, if this comes about, what I'm trying to say is, if they start building to the right of this, see, that's going to put the start of all of this where there are no people there on Yergin. There's no houses there. There's just a field. And all that would do for us as a community is allow us maybe a little bit of time, you know, to, I could still ride my bike, maybe, maybe. <laughs> so, and, the, you know, hopefully SEC and Han will not allow the construction trucks, you know, to come and come on to Yergin, because I don't know how we, were, we would live with that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just, um, it's just kind of, yeah, really sad and a nightmare. But anyway, it's, I just don't, I don't have the new one. I don't know if you do or not, but I do know that, that all of a sudden they're going to start over in front of where people live instead of to the south, I think that's south, <laughs> toward the f side of Veterans Parkway. But I, and that's just, you know, that's just a request that we would ask of them. So... Do you, are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Brenda Harold, and I'm on um, 2432 Armstrong Valley Road. And uh, my husband and I moved out there a year and six months ago. And we adopted three special need guys that's in wheelchairs, and we have twin 11-year-old girls. And we wanted them to have the country life, what I was introduced to with my mom and her family. And my husband is eight, number eight out of 17. 
So we really don't have places to host, but we moved out there so we could host and enjoy the weather, the lovely, just, you know, everything God has made out there. So my girls have a garden, they have dogs, and they love it. I love it. And my special need guys, they're not, some of them, two of them are not able to communicate, but they love the outdoors. It's so peaceful. But I'm not that far from the mall. I can go to the mall 15, 20 minutes away and still have the city life. And I didn't know about the flooding until I moved out there. And it's terrible. And it's a health hazard for us because we have the three guys that's in wheelchairs. So anything happened and we have all this traffic coming in and out, they're not able, the ambulance are not able to get to them because of all this traffic coming in. And I, I, I moved out there for peace. And if you guys can just consider if you all were in our shoes, would you want all of that traffic and all this? That was the whole purpose of getting some land out here. And I don't want to go further out to get land. I want, I love my house. It's not settled the way I want it to be, but it's in the process and I don't want to have to up and move because of the other reasons, you know, the reason of um, all these other new homes coming in. And I just want you all to take that in consideration and just look at it if, if you, if it was you, would you like it? No, you probably wouldn't, but just thank you for listening to us. Thank you, Ms. Harrell. My name is Bill Bracey. <clears throat> I live at 4156 Jurgen Road. I have a farm there, <clears throat> and uh, my property is right beside the church's property. It runs from Jurgen Road. Um, way back and it goes out to Armstrong Valley Road. Again, I bring up a sore subject, it's water. Uh, right now, if I go back there in the winter time, I can't get from one field to the other hardly because there's so much runoff water coming down through there. And if you see some of the maps, you can see how low it is there with the tree line and that's the, and that's the water where the water goes. Summertime is not no problem, Harley. When the wintertime, you can't get from one side to the other. I'm concerned, my concern is, when you build 300 more houses, and you got, to, all of them's got a roof on them, you got concrete driveways, you got other outbuildings, the water is not gonna get into the ground. There's no way for it to get in the ground. It's gonna be runoff water. I understand about the retention ponds. It's not a problem about that. That's a good thing but these retention ponds will fill up <laughs> pretty quick. And then you got, then it's gotta go somewhere. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about the amount of water that runs down through there. And of course it all runs across the church property and across my property. And then it goes out to the Armstrong Valley Road, which you've already heard about. There's no sense beating that dead horse again. In the winter months, uh, you normally uh, several times throughout the winter, it's just closed because of the high water. And of course, I have the same problem across my farm and it keeps backing up into the fields. And I'm concerned about more of it coming. <laughs> I can deal with what I'm getting now, but when, when you get that many more houses, it, it's gonna be more water coming off. Uh, um, uh, that, that's, that's my issue. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell me, Ms. Michelle, did you get, I couldn't understand his last name, was it? Gracie. Gracie. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gracie. Um, I have a question. This is Pat Sanders. Um, the water problem, yes. I know what it is like on Jurgen Road when it rains so much and fills up there. We have to go down to Fan Road over to Harrison Road to get to Murfreesboro. I mean, we know what it's like in front of the Lesters on Armstrong Valley Road when it's up there or in front of the Pikes. We know we have to go uh, south. 
These detention ponds are, are they retention or detention? Detention. D. Yes. Detention. 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 The, uh, Bill Huddleston, my friend and civil engineer, has told me that's for rainwater. And they do fill up. So if the detention ponds, just three are planned, and they all fill up, then, then, then where does the rest of the water go? I think it's a, a massive problem. I think this is a massive project, and I wish it could be 100 houses rather than 300 also, but the water is the big concern. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Well, I was hoping on being last, <laughs> if I would last. My name is Donald White. I live at 4121 Yergin Road. I want to talk to you something about to each of the men and ladies who are going to be making this decision. First of all, I want to talk to you about, and Dave, all, I just, I'm not going to spend time talking about the water problems or the traffic problems. There's nothing that's been said tonight that money will not fix. I know that, and you know that. You give enough money, they will fix it. But I'm going to tell you something tonight that can't be fixed. I know we're going to have a traffic problem. There's no doubt about it. I have seen in Murfreesboro what happens when four lanes go into two lanes. And not a one of you have not experienced that. It's aggravating and frustrating. We cannot build the roads fast enough for the growth that's going on in Rutherford County and, may I say, Murfreesboro. Mayor, I don't know how long you've been here, but I've been here since the beginning, not the beginning of time. <laughs> Your beginning. <laughs> but let me just give you a little brief background and then I'll move on and sit down. I'm going to tell you something you can't fix. Not a one of you can fix what I'm about to tell you. Not a one of you. I don't care how you vote. You can't fix it. There's only one person that can fix it. He's here. Magnolia Grove Development Property. I grew up in Murfreesboro. My daddy was the district operating superintendent of the TVA. I used to get up at night and go with him when we had power outages. I grew up here in Murfreesboro and moved here when I was six months old. I have been in the United States Air Force and I am a veteran. And I'm proudly to know that I represent not only Rutherford County, but Murfreesboro. I'm proud to see the progress has happened. Sometimes I wonder how far this is going to go. You can't stop the deer that play out there. They're going to die. We'll have a time when we don't see deer like they do in major metropolitan cities. You won't see quail. You won't see all of the other type of animals. The turkey that we see out there now. I'm asking you to think about, I have lived here most of my life, except when I was in the Air Force and I was doing another type of job outside of the Air Force. So I grew up here. I've seen it. And every time I would come back, I didn't like what I saw. It, grow, it was growing too fast. Now, I'm for progress. And I know there's probably not a person here that's not for progress. 
But there comes a time in our life when we really have to consider this progress, progress it's making. I grew up, and some of you will know, Critchlow Elementary School. Mr. White, I don't want to rush you, but we're, we're way over three minutes. If you want to wrap it up a little bit, if you don't mind. So I am the last one. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm trying to. I'm, we're at five now, so I want okay. to. You're okay. on a roll. I didn't want to stop you, but. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Um, but what you can't fix, and I've seen this all from all these schools I went to, including Middle Tennessee State University. So this has been my home. When we moved out on Yergin Road, we wanted to move in the country. This is going to remove that country. What you can fix with a dollar, you cannot fix from the heart. And every one of you are going to have to make a decision not only from the head, but also from the heart. And I hope you will understand why we're here tonight, trying to urge you to reconsider having this community built in a very rural setting. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, I have a paper here. Most of the men on the city council, I sent it to. And sure. here's an extra copy. Uh, if, if, if Ms. Michaudo. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Anyone else wishing to speak? Okay. I didn't want to speak, but I. My name is Glenda Cox. I live on 4100 Michelle Street. Uh, with, you made me want to cry. I was born in Barfield, so 60 years. Um, Y'all are calling these um, detention, retent, whatever these things, these bodies of water you're calling them, it's crawfish land. It's not, and they're going to put walking paths? Okay, all you're going to do is, is they're going to have to bring extra shoes when they walk. It's just, it's a swamp. That's all these things are, are swamps. And it will not be, you cannot contain a swamp unless you dynamite them, blow them up, start all over. Um, and this doesn't even look at what are you going to do to the cemetery that is right next to the crawfish land. You're going to flood these graves that have been there for hundreds of years. Is anybody even considering that? I mean, I just think it's, there's a lot to be considered. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Anyone else wishing to speak? <clears throat> My name is Doris Martin. I live at 4028 Ashley Drive. I want to talk to you today about um, the decision you're getting ready to make. It is not a personal decision. It will not affect your lives in a personal way at all, but it will a lot of people in our community. Um, there needs to come a time where you need to say, we need to stop building because it's getting out of hand. We have a wildlife out there. The road is not equipped. My husband drives an 18 wheeler for a living. You can't get an 18 wheeler out there. It's blind curves. Um, and I'm concerned about the construction, the blasting, how it's gonna affect these graves, how it's gonna affect us, because I can already hear the blasting from the community in front of this one on veterans at my house. And I live at the end of Ashley Drive and we are a family back there. And when I say family, I mean we take care of each other. When one hurts, we all hurt. I don't see communities like that anymore. I did when I was little. Our neighbors, we take care of each other's kids. We watch out for each other. If somebody needs some sugar, we'll give you sugar. I mean, we are just, it, it, that is such a big quality of my life to have that. Because I love them just like I love my family. 
and I would do anything for them and they would do the same for me and we look out for each other and this community that's going to be coming in is going to change the whole dynamics of everything that we love and cherish in our heart so um, this ain't going to affect you personally you've probably got your mind made up um, the money's where it's at but um, I'm just pleading with you to actually take all these voices into consideration that have spoke against it tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Anyone else wishing to speak? Thank you, Ms. Martin. Okay, seeing now, we're going to close the public hearing. And we'll consider for passage on first reading ordinance 17 OZ 46 to zone an area located along Jurgen Road is planned residential development PRD district simultaneous with annexation before we do that uh, leadership Rutherford y'all are free to go <laughs> <laughs> have a great night everybody unless y'all want to see you're well you're, you're welcome to stay so uh, all right uh, we've got several questions that I, I wrote down um, and I don't know how we want to do this, uh, Mr. Huddleston, uh, Mr. Whitaker, but we had a, a question on, I think, one of the ones that we had a lot on is a hydrology report. Good evening, Mayor McFarland, Sam Huddleston, City Engineering Department. Um, you know, a question came up at Planning Commission and also in the neighborhood meeting, and uh, really maybe should we should uh, back up and, and think about the process a little bit. This is a zoning application. It's not a final design. Um, as our process, as plans work through our process, the hydraulics and hydrology reports are due with the final design uh, of the actual neighborhood. Mr. Taylor and his team uh, do enough research and enough investigation of the property to, to be able to um, adequately manage drainage there and adequately make sure there's enough space for their detention ponds. Um, but the hydraulics and hydrology reports, according to our development process, would be uh, due at a later time in the process. And part of it's about investment and part of it's about spending and part of it's about having enough information uh, to do those studies. And certainly uh, a developer wouldn't want to... Uh, spend the money on a hydraulics and hydrology study if the zoning is not approved. And so uh, the normal course of action would be uh, consider it for zoning and then uh, address the detailed design issues and that would be our normal course of action. Okay, can you also talk about um, flooding and then also uh, detention ponds? Uh, and, and so there, there are uh, in our, our research and discussion and observations there, there are uh, potentially uh, several areas that um, experience flooding from time to time. Um, Jurgen Road, we believe, uh, and from the testimony of the neighbors at, at previous meetings, uh, overtops, the water overtops the road on Jurgen Road in the vicinity of this property from time to time. I think if, if you recall Mr. Taylor uh, discussed uh, uh, increasing uh, the size of of the pipes under Jurgen Road as that water drains onto the uh, to the subject property uh, and, and we're, we're certainly uh, confident that would would alleviate much of the observations we see there on Jurgen Road. Uh, the the property itself has been has been described in many of the the lots adjacent to it. Uh, their their wetlands and ponds and other water features I guess is how I would want would want to describe it so the the area is wet in general to begin with um, and so uh, many of the properties there would exhibit standing water uh, even for days or weeks perhaps following a rain event um, and, and permanent water in many cases. Um, the, the parts of the property that um, the developers proposed to reserve are the wetlands and, and we suspect and uh, based on observations that those will continue to remain wet and they'll they will exhibit if if I could say it this way flooding but but that flooding of that property is not damaging anything stay, staying in the wetlands. Uh, Armstrong Valley is quite another question altogether uh, there's probably six or eight locations as you move from Veterans Parkway um, I, I guess I would say toward Midland Fosterville, I think that's uh, North Road and some of the 
roads further south, there are multiple uh, places there where water overtops the road, overtops the driveways, limits access. Um, there's only a small part of Armstrong Valley that's currently in the city. Most of that, uh, those areas that overtop are, uh, are currently in uh, outside the city's jurisdiction. Uh, I guess what I would say about uh, the flooding of Armstrong Valley um, and this property, uh, this, this property would create a second path out. Uh, I think we heard some testimony that, uh, that when water's over Armstrong Valley, it, uh, uh, some of the residents have to travel several miles out of their way. And we've, we've witnessed that, um, I think, as late as March of this year. Um, but, but by the constructing Pitcher's Lane up to and connecting to Jurgen Road, it would actually create a second path out for for those areas that might be um, trapped in in uh, by by water uh, over Armstrong Valley, um, and I also say that um, that with the opening of Fire Station 10, uh, we have uh, first responders who are within a half a mile of of the areas along Armstrong Valley, and and they watch that and stand ready to respond in in periods of time when we we are experiencing um, that wetter wetter weather. Sam, could I ask you a couple questions? Yes, sir. Number one, you know, they kept they referred a couple of times to the uh, the map with the little arrows on it. Um, you know, that I assume shows the the direction of the water flow. It looks like the majority of that is flowing to the north, out through the kind of the Pitcher's Lane. What we're seeing is Pitcher's Lane here. Does you know, in addition to the detention pond and the wetland up there kind of on that north section of this property do we have is there any kind of you know do, do we have anything in place any infrastructure water infrastructure in place going on out to, to veterans park through this development at pitchers lane i mean will that help that flow as it relates to i mean you know something i think matters is that so, uh, one of them brought up the idea of you know if you put 300 house tops in there you know what's a wetland now that maybe let's just say it's an acre for example sake you know it probably reasonable to think if all the water is going to one place you put 300 house tops in there it might be bigger it's probably reasonable but so what do we have in place to i mean is, like i said i saw the arrows going and i'm kind of making some assumptions here but are we able to take the water off to the north and out through pitchers lane yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Lalance, I think uh, I think that's a, a very pertinent observation. The uh, existing drainage patterns for the proposed property actually mostly to the north. There's a small area, uh, the wetland area that's in the southwest corner actually drains back across Jurgen Road, and and drains is probably a very generous word for what it does there. But but both sides of Jurgen Road, right around that wetland. Uh, have some existing water features, but for the, but I would guess maybe 95 percent of the property drains to the west, um, and uh, in areas where we develop and have constructed drainage systems, those are prepared to take the water that's coming to them from upstream. And so yes, there's a constructed system uh, in place in the west wind development that that would route uh, the waters through there and then on into the uh, drainage systems of Veterans water. Parkway. Uh, they, they coincidentally, one, one side goes to Armstrong Branch, the other side goes to Spence Creek, so there's, this property is actually on a, uh, a divide between those two creek basins there as well. And, and those detention ponds, um, you know, I was listening to, you know, it's, those aren't random, are, let me ask you this, are they randomly put where they're put, or are they, are they a certain depth based on how much runoff there's going to be, or are they just kind of like every detention pond is three feet deep and, and half an acre big no matter where you put it at any development or do we take into account hey there's a lot of runoff there's 300 house tops it needs to be deeper here or how does that work yes the i think it's a, a very good question the um, um the design engineer here in this case mr taylor and his team um uh, they use some pretty standard um estimating um routines to, to estimate for this development for this amount of ground cover for the amount of impervious area we need to set aside eight or ten percent and then they look at the drainage patterns and say well obviously those are going to go best at the low points the actual sizing routine takes into consideration all of those drainage conditions and we can even consider downstream limitations and say well 
we just can't let that much water out of this pond and we can actually oversize those ponds and we do that quite frequently when we do understand that there are downstream drainage limitations. And that, that comes into play kind of after the hydrology or whatever you call the other report? I mean, is well, that that's right. So we apply the, we, we, we have a good, uh, good record of rainfall. Uh, NOAA has uh, very extensive rainfall records in their database and so we can apply uh, rainfall rates to this runoff pattern and, and our um, friends in the agricultural industry had, have developed a, a very good runoff estimating tool that we now use in urban development, believe it or not, and that's supplemented by additional research. And so we, we can really estimate pretty good for these smaller two to three hundred acre developments. We can really estimate the rainfall and runoff effects pretty accurately and then estimate the size that the pond needs to be, the size that the pipe needs to be leaving that pond to make sure that we do store those waters uh, until they can be safely uh, conveyed downstream. All right, one last question on this water thing. If, if you guys go through the hydro hydrology reports, they go through and do spend the money based on the fact that they see that, you know, that it gets zoned and it comes back and, and, and you guys say, hey, look, these detention ponds are gonna have to be twice as big and twice as deep as what you said. I mean, have you seen cases like that in the past where it has actually reduced the number of homes that kind of came in the original plan? Yeah, there, there are some situations where for, for whatever reason, uh, the, the actual detailed design, you may see a, a, an additional lot or two set aside for a common area and expanded, expanding the, the stormwater management area. What this plan would represent would be a maximum zoning density. This would be the, the maximum number of housing units they could get. Uh, and if for some site development reason, site design reason, they needed to increase the size of a pond, uh, they would, and it cost them a lot. It, it just simply costs them a lot. Uh, Mr. Huddleston, I think the answer to his question is most recently the Highland Avenue project was completely scrapped because the hydrology plan and the soil test showed that they couldn't develop the property as they assumed that they might be able to on the original plants. And we had original plants just like these. And yes. the whole idea was scrapped, so. Yes, and, and that's that's part of their due Sorry, diligence. And then you, that's, that's exactly correct, Mr. Smotherman, that as you advance through and, and gather more data, you have to, you make more detailed um, uh, predictions about what will happen and how much you can yield. And, and certainly that'd be the case with, with their stormwater management. And and I would say, Mr. LaLance, that, that, that we, um, we expect uh, that Mr. Taylor would not want us to tell him to make them two times larger, but that he would actually realize that as he submits the plans and, and determine that, yeah. that they need to be twice as large in your example or twice as deep perhaps. Yeah, yeah, so I miss, yeah, that's, I understand that. So with that in mind, can we get the uh, study done? I know you say we usually get the study done after this is voted on. Can we reverse it and get the study done first? Uh, Let's see what it looks like. Certainly, Ms. Uh, uh, Scales Harris, you can you can condition this approval on a lot of different things. I would say that that would not be a routine request. I would say it'd be very uh, atypical for us to request a, a complete hydraulics and hydrology study when you haven't surveyed the property, when you haven't uh, uh, completely laid out all of the drainage system, the pipes and connections, and all of that. It'd be uh, very atypical for us to expect that at this point in the zoning process. But that would still give us the review of that if we approve it and then that's basically on staffs and the developers and well, SEC's uh, opinion. It's the actually city code. There's a requirement in the city code that they comply with our stormwater management requirements and that's what we will hold them to. So that's all, you already have that tool in city code that says that you have to do the study, you have to demonstrate that you meet the requirements, and, and that is uh, due with the uh, final construction plans for each phase. And, and so the, the, the normal routine would be to, to get that with the construction plan. And, and I can tell you, having done this for 18 years, we don't, we don't hold back on that. We don't let people off on that. We expect them to meet the standards, and our design teams consistently do that. You might know the answer to this. I'm sorry, I was gonna ask road questions, but just while, you get, while I got you, when you go up north through Pitcher's Lane and there's that, that development there, I can't tell from my map and my, my Google Earth thing is too old. 
is, is there just one? Do you know if there have? Is it just this pitcher's lane the only road that goes out to to veterans? Yeah, I can't tell if that. Yes, and this in 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 the development that's currently in place, pitcher's lane is the only road traveling to the north uh, to the Veterans to Parkway. What I will tell you is that the property to the west uh, is currently being development, developed and their development plan uh, provides additional points of ac access out to Veterans Parkway and additional stub streets to uh, the properties that are, that are north and west of here. And then uh, it'd be staff's expectation as we move and, and perhaps if we see properties develop to the east that they would connect to the stub streets and also ad extend additional routes out to Veterans Parkway to the north. And for that matter, um, if, if they abut uh, Jurgen Road, we would expect them to, to tie into the stubs and provide additional routes uh, to Jurgen Road and, and between Jurgen Road and Veterans Parkway. And I think those were, were certainly uh, uh, things that we've done for, for quite a while here, but it's also some of the recommendations that were in the 2035 plan to increase connectivity and mobility in our street networks and, and um, what we have in place in the, in the properties to the north and then what they're proposing here certainly appears to do that. Could you describe uh, Jurgen Road? How, how would you describe Jurgen Road in its present condition? How I would describe Jurgen Road is, is a, a, a road that I believe was developed as a farm lane. Uh, it was actually set in place to, to serve the farming community there, followed perhaps property lines or the most convenient way to get in and out of the properties uh, that, that uh, over time the county took over maintenance um, and, and then developed into um, what we call a two-lane ditch section uh, county road. Uh, it would be very similar. Uh, perhaps to, to Rucker Lane, very similar to the old Manson Pike, which was referred to tonight, and, and some of the other existing county roads. What, what's going to compel the county to improve? I mean, we've got three lanes in front of this project, but what's going to compel the county to improve Jurgen Road? Well, um, yeah, I'm not sure I can speak for the county uh, to say what would compel them to do that. Certainly, uh, Mr. Brooks has, has uh, uh, historically had a very aggressive um, paving and shoulder and road widening program. They typically do not do projects of the magnitude that the city does, which would be curb and gutter and sidewalk, um, but, but he has been very aggressive in, the, in his term um, as road superintendent in, in safety improvements. And, and those sorts of things, um, and certainly uh, would have the capability perhaps to do something like that here on, on Jurgen Road. Um, the three lane improvement that he's proposing is not city standard curb guttering sidewalks. That's it would not be at this point. It would, it would, it would certainly give the ability to add that, that center turning lane to accommodate those left turns. I have a quick question, um, traffic. And we had lots of questions on traffic, but um, I would assume that the majority of people who leave who live here are not going to go south down Jurgen Road to get to where they're going. They're going to go back to Veterans Parkway north. So, do, do we take that into account when we're looking at at, at the design? Yes, so the, uh, the, the traffic go, impact study that was you go south, referenced. you're going to have to go south of Jurgen turn out to Armstrong Valley, and then if you take a left, you're going to Midland Fosterville. If you take a right, you're going back to Veterans Parkway. So it just seems like people would take a straight shot to go back to Veterans Parkway through the neighborhood. Yes, and I think, I think the, the residents of the, of the neighborhood would find the more direct routes out, and we do believe that to be the pitcher's lane to Veterans Parkway for most drivers. Um, based on what we uh, see as the city's urban center and the, and the destinations, really, because you're talking about this is an origin for traffic. It's a traffic sure. uh, trip generator. You're going from home to school, from home to work, and so those destinations are generally going to be more accessible from Veterans Parkway, uh, we'd expect for most of the residents here. So how do we, I, I had written a note on that, too. How do we get to 2,800 extra trips? Is that, is, and is I'm going I'm I'm to look over at, at our uh, assistant uh, transportation director and, and ask if he wants to supplement this. But I think the, the 2800 ADT was trips for the total development. And so those would be divided 
uh, between the, the, the three primary routes, uh, one to the north and then two to the that south. That answers my question. I, so that's the 2,800 is total increase based on the full development. It doesn't mean that 2,800 are going to come out on Yergin Road. That's correct. That is, uh, uh, yeah, that's good evening, May and uh, members of the council. That 2,800 number that was mentioned is a 24-hour traffic volume at full build-out. That will be anywhere, th their build-out period may be between 5 to 10 years. So 10 years later, when it's full build-out, the total average tra traffic generated by this development, the 300 homes, will be about 2,800. So if you take that and... Um, Normally during the peak hour, it's about 10% of the 24-hour uh, volume, which is about 280 vehicles. So now we are talking about 280 vehicles during the a.m. peak hour, which is about from about 7 to 8 o'clock in the morning. And this is during a 10-hour, I mean a 10-year period. There are going to be other connections like what Mr. Huddleston just alluded. On the west, there's going to be some development. So there will be other opportunities, not just Pitches lane, but other connections by the time it's fully built out. Yeah. I got one more question. I'm sorry. This is it. It's a, a probably for you, Matt. Is there is there anything at all that can be done as it relates to the construction traffic? I mean, I would assume the people on Pitchers Lane aren't going to want you taking every construction truck that direction either. Um, I mean, is there... Is there any solution for that, really, that's... that's I think that uh, we can control the heavy construction equipment, um, which way they come in and which way they come out, for the most part. Uh, when you get to the home building side, that gets a little harder. I think we just um, saw some of that at Prim Springs. Yeah. Um, so whenever you start restricting access to rights of way, I, I think that gets to be a little more difficult. Um, I, I would say that most we would think that most of our construction traffic would come from the pitcher's lane side because that's where we're going to start our construction at. That's where our water and sewer has to come, and we don't traditionally try to come across half uh, all of our other property to get to where we want to work. Excuse me just a second while you're there. Could you speak a little bit to the phasing of this? I know it's in your plan book, but... Yes, sir. So... Phase one, we originated because of where our water and sewer uh, have to come from. They have to come from Pitcher's Lane to the north, so uh, we have to start our first phase there. And then the second phase was to uh, try to get a secondary access um, onto another road. So we wanted to extend that down to Jurgen. Now, if uh, I think uh, I had her name here, one of the uh, ladies mentioned possibly moving that to the other side to the other entrance that was away from the homes we'll be happy to look at that we're not married to which one we bring online first but i think that uh, uh, staff did want us to go ahead and have a secondary access there and the rest of that is uh, mainly driven on where we connect to sewer and where sewer can connect to where you see phase six and five uh, those will be served from a different sewer connection for the most part than what phase one because that property starts to fall back toward the north uh, in that little finger that goes up to the east of west wind uh, the res and as well as seven and eight so phase five will come online we would bring sewer for five through phase six then we would construct phase six and then we would continue to extend that sewer up through seven eight and what we show is nine right now and that's that's driven entirely off of uh, where sewer comes from. Mr. Mr. Taylor, we had a question about about grave sites. Is that something y'all are aware of? Uh, we are aware that there are grave sites on the property to the west of us at, at the church location. Yes, sir. And that is, if you look at where we're preserving the wetlands in that southwest corner, if you go direct between there and where you see the church facility, they are located in there primarily, is my understanding. But is that on your property? No, sir. It's on the church property. Okay. It's right here, Shane. Do we know there are no more graves other than on the church property? Yes, ma'am. I, I think my, my understanding is most of those are marked on their property, um, but we've had no reports of anything on our side. What church is that? You know? Remember? It's a Cherry Grove. 
Are you, are you guys required to, to not have a disparate impact, or if you'd call it that, you know, any kind of negative impact on something like that? I mean, oh, you're talking about the, the graves? Yeah. Um, we would not, especially if they're on our property, we would just set them to the side. We would not touch them. Um, with them being on somebody else's property, we definitely won't touch them because we won't be messing with anybody well, else's property. I just property. mean like water flow, I think, was sort of the thing. If you right, know, So I think create a, uh, so where, we will, where water will exit our property will be to the north of where I understand the grave sites to be. Okay. Mr. Taylor, we had a question about buffering. I don't remember that one. Uh, it was height of the buffer. It was the height of the, the height of the buffer. What's the? Okay, so we had the 50 foot wide landscaped area between Yergin Road and the back of the homes, and so with that we're proposing a, uh, th a minimum of three foot tall berm with a type B buffer, and the type B we really just try to relate that back to something in the zoning ordinance so that staff can review that and make sure we're doing what we say we want to do at a later date. So a type B buffer, are you thinking that that total berm with three feet, it's going to be in the, Sam, what would the height of that total buffer be? Yes, Mayor, I think at the time of planting, those trees would normally be um, uh, on the order of four to six feet uh, nursery stock, and so that would elevate them in the order of seven to ten feet at the time of planting, and then with growth and grow in, it would be uh, much more significant than that. The last question we had. I don't say last, but I wrote down what. But uh, there was a question about ME or EMS that uh, on emergency service uh, people being able to get in and out. It, it, so if someone on Station Ten. Yes, Mayor. I think the the question was with with Armstrong Valley, perhaps uh, underwater from time to time. How would how would emergency responders access the area? And I think we had, we had discussed earlier that Pitcher's Lane gives a very good alternative access or maybe a primary access depending on the situation uh, for our responders from Fire Station 10 as well as uh, potential county responders uh, that might be going into the Thompson Road, Armstrong Valley, Jurgen Road area and might be limited if they're coming in off Armstrong Valley. But also, worst case scenario, our Station 9 is uh, on Cason Lane is not very far away that's park. right, and, and if you'll recall, um, Fire Chief uh, uh, Folks has um, changed their response plan so that there is a primary station that responds and a backup station that responds to every call. Uh, before it was a primary station with call back if they need it, but now it's an automatic response. And so if, if one responding unit does have problems with access, they've certainly already got another responding unit en route uh, from a close by station. That for that area it would be Case and Lane, and then a backup station would be the the Church Street station, uh, would be the, the the third responding station if it were needed. Mr. Taylor, can I ask one more question? And this is a question that comes up time and time again, and it it was alluded to by several of the speakers. Uh, and, and it's a question that they raised at the neighborhood meeting, and I'd like to hear your response to, uh, they're requesting less density. What, what is your response to that? What can you, what can you say to the, the neighborhood's desire to have fewer than 300 homes? I think there's a couple of different responses there. Um, one of those being economics. Um, obviously, Every time I stand before you, it's because my client is proposing a project, and that project has to be profitable in the end for the, pro for the project to occur. And uh, that profitability comes from the number of lots or the size of the building um, what it, or the number of units, uh, whatever that is that we are proposing at that particular time. Um, and the other sp side of that is I think that um, – this is this density um, is in line and um, I, I believe that um, many years ago we set this aside inside our urban growth boundary and in general the city is going to have uh, more dense development than the county but 
Uh, the density that we're proposing here is not much different than the density that you see occurring um, outside the city limits at this particular time. So I, I feel like that it's not an overly dense project um, and, and is in line with um, what needs to be done, what, what needs to occur in this, on this property itself. I'm gonna make a comment and if you have more questions, I, I just uh, on the density and I was just sitting here doing some math trying to figure it out. I mean, this is actually less dense than a bulk RS-15 zoning. I mean, an RS-15 zoning would allow for 310 houses. I just did the math. And, and so, I mean, our, just so you guys know, our least restrictive or the biggest lots that we have in a bulk zoning is, is RS-15. So the biggest lots that we can do in a bulk zoning, this actually has less rooftops than in our, you know, what you guys, I think, would consider your best case scenario, you know, and what if we just annex this and they didn't ask for a PRD, it comes in automatically as RS-15, which means they could do 310 rooftops. The only consideration, Rick, is the wetlands and the property that's not developed. But they still your, 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 your unit, your, your lot yield is going to be less because of the wetlands and because of the, the other mitigating circumstances of the land that you have. That's, that's you know, yeah, it's, I guess, true on every one, but yeah. here's the offset to that. The offset to that is when you have a PRD, you know, it's, you know what you're getting to. That's you know, right. RS-15 could be, you don't know what they look like. You don't know what the roads, where the roads are going to go. You don't know where the detention ponds are going to be. None of this stuff that they laid out here for us is, is there at all. That's just by getting a straight annex and having the bulk zone. There is no certainty whatsoever. So, I mean, I, and I, I, you know, I'm a, I have to sort of say this. Miss White mentioned something, you know, that's, that's uh, I think probably, you know, somebody had a tear in their eye about it. And I, me too, I get it about, you know, freedom and all that kind of stuff. You know, the other side of the coin that makes this tough on us is, you know, the freedom for somebody to do what they want to do with their property that they rightfully own. You know, this is their property, they bought it, and they're trying to do something that's well within the bounds of what we've structured is what we're doing in, in the city and for our growth plan. And so it's hard for us to kind of say, well, look, yeah, I know we said it's okay to do this, but just kidding. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, definitely um man hear what you're saying and i hate you know the idea of as far as changing changing some dynamics and all that but um certainly i've been here all my life it's not quite as long as you've been here uh, mr white but seeing a lot of change i used to ride my bike up memorial boulevard you know, when i was 10 years old which we'd never do now but um, with that in, in mind i you know I, it's hard for me to look at this and say i don't think it's at least a pretty good development and and something that fits and and we we need affordable housing we hear about that all the time and there's no way we get that without having some of these single-family homes period unless you want apartments and so it's kind of like well this is a you know to me a really something that we need a lot um so anybody have any, any questions anymore yeah i, I just Again, I'm sorry, Mr. Taylor, <laughs> you didn't go back. Uh, I got smarter what's the, that time. Yeah, that's right. You learn. Uh, what is the time frame? I know it's market driven, but in all these phases, what are we talking about? Uh, so we would anticipate starting construction with the first phase in uh, the spring of next year. And we would anticipate this to probably be in roughly an eight to 10 year project, I would say, Mr. Shacklett. And there's nothing on, on the, Mr. Helson, there's no improvements to Jurgen Road, major thoroughfare plan, anything else? You're correct, well, Mr. Shacklett. This is uh, it's, it's not identified on our major transportation plan, the current plan or the uh, 2040 proposed plan. Um, what uh, what we see in these situations is, is that those are generally addressed upon development, um, and, and there could be a time when um, uh, based on development and growth that the city and the county see the need to make some improvements there um, and, and we can certainly bring it back as a as a project similar to, to Rucker Lane similar to Brinkley Road which were uh, you know roadways that I would 
the, they are our neighbors to this, or even Kimbrough Road, which we actually came back and reconstructed as a as a five lane curb and gutter section. I think Miss Campbell had also asked. Miss Campbell, I'll talk in the microphone to make sure I'm. I think she had talked about Rucker Lane, um, but Rucker Lane we're going to have under construction pretty soon, aren't we? Yes, it's. Um, I think it's on our CIP, and I'm going to look at Mr. Crumley and see if he'll nod his head up and down or, or maybe help me out here a little bit. It's on our, our capital improvement plan for the second year, or is it this year and carrying over to the second year? I think it was this year carrying over to next year. Yeah. Miss Sanders, right? Okay, sorry about that. Yes, ma'am. I mean, yes, ma'am. Yeah, we're we're it's coming, right? it, it's it's coming. So. Very dangerous. Yes, ma'am. All right. Any other questions? I know a lot of material has been. We've heard a lot of comments, and a lot of material has been given to us tonight, which I'm kind of finding a little hard to digest right now. Um, I just still have a lot of questions, so I'm not saying I'm not for it, but I just have still have a lot of questions. But well, we have two readings. Well, this is this one that gets two readings, or is yes, it sir, two readings. Are we meeting next week? Yes, I believe so. I'm going to propose something, uh, and I know it's, as Mr. Huddleston said, out not the normal process, but given some of the concerns of the neighborhood and the water flow in this neighborhood, I'm going to request that we require the hydrology report prior to moving forward on this. And uh, I think everybody would feel a little more comfortable with it if we... Uh, if we move in that direction uh, and have a little bit more information uh, rather than just speculation. You got a comment on that? Yes, Mr. Shackley, if I could just maybe make a, a recommendation there, uh, seeing as, as uh, Mr. Taylor wouldn't have all of the detailed information about the proposed conditions, uh, we, we, I, I would recommend maybe we, we do that hydrology report on the existing conditions, analyze existing drain drainage and runoff patterns and estimate the runoff volumes from that. So that gives us a starting position to know uh, what we need to protect and how we need to protect it. But Mr. Charleston, the only question I, I would have is if, if they need to know pipe sizes and all the road information and it, is that going to be tough for them to give what an accurate hydrology report is when they don't have construction plans and they can't? I mean, it, it, it seems like you would you would get your hydrology report and, and you're doing your design all at the same time. And if we require them to do something that they can't use, it, it, I don't know. Well, certainly establishing the, the hydrology, the runoff patterns for the existing site. Yeah. Um, in the existing topography would be would be very easy for them to do at this stage the 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 phasing and detailed design and development is something that um, that would require complete survey of the property and complete design of the roadway network uh, and drainage network before they'd be able to to, com to fully execute that um, and so that means a 100 percent design basically of the full site before zoning is before zoning is entitled which makes that designing an enti entire site before it's zoned i assume we've not done that before have we 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 we, we routinely do not do that we we rely on the the city code that requires them to uh, not to increase the degree of flooding and we require on the city require rely i'm sorry we rely on the city code that requires them to uh, provide certain stormwater management uh, programs and meet certain um, uh, expectations and, and design criteria uh, for that and that doesn't change regardless of the zoning that 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 ordinance applies to any development 
Um, and, and so we do have that standard out there. Um, and, and Mr. Shacklett, if it's any consolation to you, uh, the design team, uh, they don't want flooding problems that result from this development. And certainly the city staff, we don't want flooding pr problems to result from this development. So we, we do pay very particular attention to that and, 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 and do take it very important. I, I, I know you do, and I have that history to be able to prove that. But the folks that are neighbors out there, I, this is a, as much for them as it is for, for us. That's right, uh, and is, so this is a dramatic change in their neighborhood, as they've stated tonight. And I and I think their concerns about how water, uh, you know, the existing water problem, and how this is, they don't see what we're saying. They're basically having to take it on. And I and I understand yes. what you're saying, but I, this is more as as much for the neighbors and for that community out there that is going to see significant changes in the life that they have and I and I think this gives them some uh, I guess uh, at least calms their concerns to some degree to have something that, that, that basically confirms that they can that they're not going to be affected by the water because I mean when you see an existing wetland in a detention area right next to the major third the road that they come in and out of right now and, and then you're building the 300 homes over there and then to tell them that there is not going to be a problem I mean, it, it's just, it's hard for them to see that. I, I understand, and we, we've seen developments where it's actually, development has actually helped drainage, by the way. Uh, it actually ha helped a drainage situation in, in an area that relieved a lot of problems that have been there for historically for years. But, uh, and, and it may be, and I trust uh, Mr. Taylor, and, and the, they do quality work, so I'm sure that they would, pro they would handle this. But this, this study gives something for the, the neighbors to kind of, th this has been more than just a piece of paper with a couple of errors on it. And, sure. and you, you understand what I'm saying? I do, and that's, and that's why I recommended that we, that the hydraulics, the hydrology study be limited to the existing conditions. There you go. Okay. And if we, if we do it with the existing conditions, we can identify uh, the, the drainage patterns that exist on the property, and not just on the property, the offsite drainage patterns as well. And, and we can identify those and, and make sure that we are considering those and protecting uh, those properties, those areas where the water actually uh, does drain back toward Jurgen Road. Uh, the majority of this water actually drains away from Jurgen Road, but there is a small part that drains toward Jurgen Road. And so I think with that existing uh, hydrology study of the existing uh, surf land surfaces out there would certainly identify uh, the drainage basins and then the uh, adjacent drainage basins that they're interested in. That makes sense, um, and I also have a concern, being that mortician is in my blood, I'm concerned about that uh, cemetery. I know uh, our funeral home bury a lot in the uh, Cherry Grove Cemetery, and I know at one point, uh, maybe a year ago, they were in the process, a couple of years ago, identifying a lot of graves, and a lot of graves they had not identified, and I know that cemetery is kind of deep out there, and that's a concern. I just want to have peace of mind that, you know, that cemetery is in that confined area and it's not any part of the area where, you know, we may be building. Yes, and, in, in, and if, we, if we agree on the existing hydrology, that certainly part of their surveying and, and review would be in, in, uh, include a review of that uh, common lot line with the cemetery okay. and, and obtaining property line and survey information through there. So it helped us to make to draw a better conclusion about the drainage patterns and potential impact on the cemetery. Sam, how long of a process would that hydrology report take, and about what kind of cost are we talking about for something like that? I mean, is that a reasonable question to ask? I'm going to yield to Mr. Taylor. He can he can give you a much much better idea of that from from actually uh, for that just one it. step as is, whatever you know, however you were describing it. Not as fast and not as cheap as he would like. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I hate to, I, if it's, it's not appropriate, don't weeks, answer. Probably a couple of weeks, and that's I'm on vacation next week, so it'll be the week after, and then um, we'll get that done and resubmit to staff, so we can get back on, uh, get that report back to you all. And so um, it will not be. Um, Is it a five percent increase to the PRD cost, or a fifty percent increase, or like I mean, just I'm going for. I honestly, oh, I, I don't mind. know. I'm it's, sorry. Uh, I, 
I don't even know what it's cost so far. So, um, All right, I'm trying to just get an idea what what kind of it's it's what not in, on it. Uh, what we're talking about doing, we can do uh, fairly economically inside the project. So, so would it be? So can we do this in a way where we have a first reading and have it done by a second reading? That way they might feel a little bit more comfortable from the developer standpoint too that you know we're moving on with it as long as the hydrology report comes back. You know what I mean? Is that I, I, I'm just trying to think we, through we, how we can get it through the process once it comes back faster. If you remember back to the annexation, we, we've got to finish the house demo. Um, and I know that's going to take a couple of weeks because we found some asbestos in there. So um, we're going to hold uh, second reading till that. If you're comfortable with it, we could hold second reading until both those conditions, the house and the report. All right. So if we didn't get a, we didn't get a second on your motion. Oh, I didn't make a motion. Oh, I thought it was a motion. I'm sorry. Suggestion. All right. <laughs> you want to make it but if it makes it. Uh, let me make a motion and then you can vote it down. <laughs> oh, come on, Bill. <laughs> I make a motion that we defer this, first reading, we defer this until we have the uh, asbestic, asbestos removal report and the hydrology report. I second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Tucker, if you'll call the roll. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. No. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. No. Mr. Wade? No. Mayor McFarland? No. All right, that motion fails. Now we gotta say this. I'll make a motion that we. So we can say no. Approve. So, yes, yeah, so you can say no. <laughs> I think actually you might still be able to say yes now. <laughs> I'll make a motion that we approve the PRD um, under the idea, or however we would say this, to know that we won't have second reading until we get the hydrology report back and it's uh, acceptable to city staff and us as well as the uh, report on the demo on the house uh, you got that Craig yeah. <laughs> so it's basically the, it'd be passing on first reading contingent upon hydrology and um, demolition and demolition, demolition. okay Kirk second. second second motion a second uh, Miss Tucker Kirk. Uh, Mr. Wade had the second okay. Vice Mayor Scales Harris aye Mr. LaLance aye Mr. Shacklett <clears throat> <laughs> Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Okay. Uh, we'll move to item 11. Hired. Consider recommendations of the Planning Commission to schedule, schedule public nervous. hearings. We have a rezoning along Halls Hill Pike and Journey Drive, 1.25 acres from RM16 to CF, rezoning along Stones River Mall Boulevard, 29.8 acres from RM22 to P, rezoning along West Lytle Street, 1.17 acres from CH to CBD, rezoning along Raglan Avenue from 2.7 acres from RS10 to PRD Walker Station. Uh, the dates I have are November 9th or November 16th. Yes, sir. Uh, we recommend either of those dates. All the all the four all four of the public hearings can easily be handled in one night. Okay. So either one of those dates would be great. All right, November November 9th or November 16th. November 9th or 16th. Uh, 16th. I'm going the ninth. Okay. Hey, ninth. The ninth. <laughs> All right. So we have a motion for the ninth. Do we have a second? November the ninth. Second. Yeah, November ninth. November second. <laughs> that wasn't one of the recommended dates. <laughs> Sorry, man. I couldn't pass it up. It's too easy. <laughs> All right. So we have a motion. Mr. Wade, who do we? Who's our second for the I'll ninth? Be a second. Mr. Shacklett. <laughs> Ms. Tucker, if you'll call the roll. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. I will now consider recommendations of the pur purchasing director of approval of professional services agreement for creation of a small business attraction and retention program. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. If you'll recall our budget discussions, we suggested at that time in the purchasing department's goals and objectives that we were having issues uh, attracting adequate competition for our goods and services. Um, that competition allows us to get the best value for the public's dollar and allows the operating departments to get their work done. 
we had recommended at that time we consider a small business program. Since, since that time, I've been meeting with a member of our community who is, her name is Davita Taylor. Her resume is in your packet. She has a long, successful history um, developing and operating small business programs. She's done it for TDOT. She's done it for uh, Davidson County. She's done it for the Airport Authority. Um, in just a few meetings, we learned an awful lot about small business that programs that we never knew before. So we are recommending to you that we engage her services to take a look at our whole purchasing program and make recommendation to, uh, recommendations to us as to how we can restructure that program to attract small businesses to our work, particularly small businesses within our city. So that's the recommendation. I move for the recommendation of Ms. Taylor. Second. Motion second. Ms. Tucker, if you'll call the roll. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. You have a recommendation to appoint Mr. Charlie Apigian to replace Mr. Stephen Shirley on the Parks and Recreation Commission. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Mr. Tucker. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. All right, uh, we have several beer applications. Uh, yes, Mayor, we have seven tonight. All of these are ownership and name changes. They're located at 1118 Mercury Boulevard, 1209 Fortress Boulevard, 4106 Franklin Road, 3208 Shelbyville Highway, 2020 Church Street, 1849 Northfield Boulevard, and 2464 New Salem Highway. These are all pending final building and codes inspections, but have met all of our other requirements, and we recommend approval pending the building and codes inspections. All right. So moved. Motion a second. We just got a motion. Pardon. Second. <laughs> like I said, a motion and a second now. Ms. Tucker. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Do we have any statements that need to be paid? Yes. There was one. Here's yeah. we have one statement. Mr. Crumley, is this the final payment for this? The final payment. the final payment for the steam engine. By the time we get that thing paid off, it was built in 1892. <laughs> <laughs> Move for approval. Literally. Second. Second make the announcement also about when it's oh, going. Yeah, yeah. yeah there um miss mcdonald is trying to get a date nailed down but i think it is not this wednesday but uh next the 24th i think 25th 25th wednesday the 25th yeah. wednesday the 25th two two o'clock at oakland's mansion we're gonna <laughs> unveil the steam engine and we hope our new uh fire truck as well and a new fire truck 25th yes ma'am two o'clock oakland's mansion all right, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Wade. Wait, we don't have a second. Do we have a motion? You second? Motion and a second. Yeah, motion and a second. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Same. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Any other business for the staff or city council? Mayor, we've got a couple of real estate sales. Oh, that's right. You should have at your station two different memos on two different city-owned tracts of property we're recommending for sale. First one of those is 3.48 acres off of Lyle McDonald Court. Um, when the city bought West Park from the Larry McDonald Farm, Interstate 840 divided a three and a half acre remnant from the main farm property. Uh, we have a proposal from Mr. Donald McDonald to purchase that 3.48 acres at the same price that the city paid for West Park, $40,000 per acre. Mr. McDonald surrounds this parcel on three sides. Interstate 840 is the fourth side. The city has no planned use for the property at this time. Uh, we'd recommend your approval of this sale subject to any final uh, legal documentation needed to get a deed and contract in place. What's the pleasure of the council? Move for approval. Second. Call the roll, please. 
Mr. LaLance? Aye. Mr. Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Smotherman? Aye. Mr. Wade? Aye. Vice Mayor Scales Harris? Aye. The second parcel is 1.6 acres at the corner of Medical Center Parkway and Warren Street in the Gateway. Uh, we've had a proposal from 1-9 Investments MCP, which is uh, a local firm owned by Mr. Chuck Saunders. Uh, the proposed use on this 1.6 acre pr uh, parcel would be somewhere between a 12 and 15,000 square foot office building, principally for the use of Mr. Saunders Engineering Company and his wife's dental practice. Uh, they have offered $4.75 a square foot, which when you go through the calculation is a purchase price of $331,000. I failed to mention on Mr. McDonald's, it did go through the Gateway Commission and was approved unanimously at Gateway Commission. This parcel also has been through Gateway Commission and was approved unanimously. Move for approval. Second. Motion and a second, Ms. Tucker. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Smotherman. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Any other business, Mr. Crumley? Mr. Lyons? Hey, will we have second readings on those real estate sales? You, you've sold them subject to whatever final legal, frankly, Mr. Ives has to do to get some deed in the contract. Aye. All right. All right. Seeing none, we'll stand adjourned.